Yeah, so the second lecture is going to be a bit longer <laughs> uh, than the first. Um, and uh, we should make it as interactive as possible, so if people have questions. If There's going to be a lot of code on the screen. It may not be the biggest, um, but hopefully in the video you'll be able to see a little bit more clearly. Uh, okay, so um, this is going to be a big talk about doing some Bayesian modeling techniques. Uh, I'm going to start really simple. We're going to get into you know regression and the basics of regression, linear, general linear models, all pretty straightforward uh, with some really nice uh, small stand code. Uh, then we're going to get into hierarchical modeling. And hierarchical modeling, although it's a relatively, in terms of the code, a relatively simple change, it's a big conceptual change. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the math behind hierarchical modeling, um, and a lot of the computational issues, because um, these things are really hard to fit. Uh, so we'll go through a, a big series of models, eventually get down to a basic hierarchical model that has a lot of really nice properties to it. Um, okay, so this, this is a fun uh, picture. Um, I moved to London to work on Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo. I'd never been there before. Uh, I got an apartment, and literally a block away from my apartment was Stanmore Street. Uh, so a few weeks after I moved in, I looked up and I saw it and I was, thought it was a nice uh, uh, term that I had made the right choice in, in what I was doing. Um, as as I uh, appeal to at the end of, of uh, the first lecture, um, STAN is, is this tool that's meant to try to decompose, to, to decouple the two stages of inference, right? There's the building of the models, um, and then there's the tools like automatic differentiation and Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo that allowed us to automatically fit those models. So we've already talked about Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo. Now we want to talk about the modeling language, right, and have some examples of the modeling language. Um, and I, uh, before getting into that, I, I just want to note, um, it's really cool having uh, all of this kind of Japanese interest in Stan. Um, it's kind of, it's hard for us to, to capture what's going on, uh, so we really just see what's going on on Twitter. Um, and the Twitter translation of Japanese is really bad. Uh, so we have a very uh, a skewed perspective of what you guys are doing and whether you like it or not. So I'm hoping it's on the latter side. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, if you guys are interested in doing more things like this, um, you know, we are limited in travel funds, but if we're ever in the area, you know, it's always kind of cool to hang out with people. Or if you guys are ever in the States, um, we're all mostly based in New York. Um, so if you're ever around, you know, you feel free to throw us an email, and we're more than happy to, uh, uh, to meet up or have you guys at one of our meetings. Um, or if you just want to work on modeling like uh, Hiroki's done, it's great having more collaborators. Um, so if anyone's interested, uh, I do have stickers. I think I have a few more left. So hopefully there's enough for anyone who might be interested in. There's little small ones and little big ones. These fit perfectly on computers. Um, so come, come find me after, after the talk if you want a sticker. And hopefully I can propagate some, some stand propaganda and stand. Okay, uh, with that all out of the way, let's get to some modeling. Now, remember that in, we're, we're not, Stan's mostly focused, uh, focused on doing Bayesian modeling, which means we want to specify a posterior distribution. Um, so what the stand modeling language has been built around is defining a conditional density function like this. Right? We're normally going to think about it in terms of data and parameters, but it could be whatever you want. Right? You don't have to have data. Um, it, the interpretation could be data. It could be some other parameters. Q could be parameters. It could be data. It could be whatever you want. Right? Mathematically, this is what we're trying to define with the language. So what we need any kind of stand program is some specification of the data. What are we conditioning on? What are the parameters? What is our Markov chain going to explore? And then what's the actual density that relates all of those together? Right, so we're always going to have kind of three basic components to a STAN program. And so, for example, you might see something like this. So the, the first uh, thing you'll see is the data block. This is where we specify the data, what we're conditioning on. Um, and it's just a bunch of variable declarations, right? So you can see that there's an integer n, there is an array of real values x, and an array of real values y, right? And the idea is that these get specified, and then when you run STAN, say through our STAN, it's going to look at the STAN specification and try to find those variables defined somewhere, right? So you might have defined those in your R environment, and then you pass them into STAN. So these values will have been defined somewhere externally to the code. Right, but then they're now available for us to use in our model. Oops. Once we have defined the model, uh, we can now define the parameters. That's good, that's good. Um, and the parameters are, can, this could be very simple, it could be very complicated depending on what your model looks like. So here, I'm just going to have three parameters. Um, there's a real beta, there's a real alpha. So real here stands for you know, a continuous uh, parameter. 
And note on sigma, we have a constraint. So one of the cool things that you can do in Stan is set a lower bound on sigma. And this is going to do different things depending on where you define it. We have a lower bound in the data block as well, uh, but that is just a constraint that gets checked. Right? So if you define a variable in the data block, it has a lower bound of 1. After we've read in the data, we'll check to make sure that it actually has a lower bound of 1. And if it doesn't, then we'll stop the, the running of Stan so that you don't have to worry about getting some weird corrupted data. In the parameters block, we do something different. In the parameters block, we actually transform that sigma to log sigma so that when we're doing our exploration, we don't have to worry about the constraint. And that all gets taken care of behind the scenes. So what's cool about these, these constraints is that you can you know, add this, this structure to your model without having to worry about how it affects the sampling. Um, and if we do, uh, in addition to very simple univariate constraints like lower and upper bounds, uh, we also have things like multivariate constraints. You can define simplices, covariance matrices, right? These are kind of very, very uh, awkward multivariate constraints, but we'll do the same kind of trick, right? We'll undo it um, behind the scenes so that the sampling is very, very efficient and you always are guaranteed to have the constraint satisfied. <clears throat> so once we've defined the data and the parameters, now we're ready to define the model. Right? And so any Bayesian model is going to have two components. We have some priors here. Uh, and so we have a prior for beta, alpha, and sigma. And then we have the likelihood. And so we've defined the likelihood by saying that y is distributed as a normal distribution. And the mean of that normal distribution is given by this linear relationship. So we take the covariate x, multiply it by a slope, add an intercept. And then in addition to the mean, we have some heteroscedastic noise. Right? So we have the same noise no matter what the covariance is. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that we don't have a prior block and a, a likelihood block. Right? Everything gets defined at the same time. And this is due to the fact that there are some models where it's not clear what's prior and what's likelihood. You can kind of move things around because you just care about the product. And so to avoid that kind of ambiguity, we're just going to have one block here. Right? So you just define everything together. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that these are not sampling statements. Right? We're not actually drawing a beta from normal zero one. What this really means is that we're just saying beta is distributed as a normal one. And in other words, we're adding to that log posterior density a term that looks like normal beta given 0, comma, 1. Right? We're actually going to change the uh, notation in the language very soon uh, to make that a little bit more clear. Right? But all, we're, all you're doing is taking a bunch of conditional de de density functions and multiply them together. Right? And at the end, you get one big thing, and that's what we end up using for our sampling. Make sense? Excellent. OK. So now let's get into some actual models that are motivated by statistics. And we'll begin by looking at linear and general linear models. These are kind of the workhorses of modern statistics. And they really allow you to do a lot of powerful things despite their simplicity. And so these are really all rooted in this idea of regression. And regression is based on the idea that your data naturally decomposes into two parts. There's covariates, which you tend to know pretty well, and there's variates that are much harder to figure out. So in many cases, you'll have both variates and covariates, but in a lot of cases, you'll just have the covariates. So what we want to be able to do is predict what will the variates look like if we know the covariates. Right? And so we'll, you can imagine this graphically. On the x-axis, we have the covariates. On the y-axis, we have the variates. We have some data. So clearly, there's some kind of stochastic relationship going on. And we want to be able to model that. Right? We want to model that probabilistically so that in the future, when we have new covariates, we can understand what kind of response to expect. And the uh, most general way we can talk about dealing with that is having a joint distribution over the y and the x's. Right? So on the left, we have a likelihood that includes both the y's and the x's. And now we're going to decompose it into the probability of y given x and then the probability of x. Right? And this is the kind of the natural decomposition because we want to know what's y given x. Right? That's, that, sec that first term is what's going to encode the relationship, the regression between these two forms of data. Um, right? So the, the kind of uh, focus on the regression modeling is going to be choosing this conditional distribution. But we do have to be careful about that second distribution, that probability of pi of, of x given the parameters. 
Now, typically, we assume that the covariates don't depend on the parameters, right? The, the covariates that we get are come from some random process, but that process is completely independent of anything else in the model. It doesn't at all depend on how the variates relate to the covariates. And oftentimes, that's an okay assumption. But this assumption breaks if you have, for example, selection bias, right? You might imagine that there's some covariates you don't measure if theta is big enough, or there's some covariates that you don't measure if theta is too small, right? And so this assumption that the covariates don't depend on the parameters is an assumption, right? It doesn't always hold. And so in particular, so we're going to make this assumption now and, and kind of go through the, the typical consequences. But keep in mind that if you think you have selection bias or any kind of observation bias, first thing you're going to want to do is go back to here and plug in a non-trivial distribution for the covariates. Okay, so if we go back to our decomposition, right, we can always do that top form. Now we're going to make this assumption that the covariates don't depend on the parameters. Right? So we don't have any kind of selection bias. Once we've done that, that second term, that probability of the x of the covariates, that's just a, a normalizing constant. Right? That's just some term that doesn't depend on the parameters. So we can drop it. Right? And then our joint likelihood just becomes this regression likelihood. Right? The entire data generating process is specified by how we generate y's given the covariates x. Right. OK, so that's why regression just worries about that particular relationship. So now the question is, what kind of forms do we choose for this relationship? Right? We have an infinite number of possible regressions. Um, and this is where the modeling is going to come in. Now, there's various ways of doing this, but there's one very particular uh, form that shows up often uh, over and over again. And there is that we leave the stochastic relationship open, something for you guys to choose. But we introduce a deterministic relationship. So we say that the covariates only affect one of the parameters in, in that probability distribution, and they do so through some discrete, uh, some deterministic function f. Right? So imagine taking some probability distribution, grabbing one of the parameters, and saying the covariates only affect that parameter. So for example, say we have a normal distribution. right? We can say that the mean of that normal distribution depends on the covariates through some relationship, but the noise doesn't. The noise is, is heterogeneous, sorry, homogeneous over all the possible covariates that you could have measured. Um, so that's just one example, but you can imagine taking any distribution and doing this. So this is a very, very general way of trying to incorporate the covariates into a known stochastic distribution. Um, so you could have uh, that normal distribution. You could also imagine having a binomial distribution. Right? So say that we, our data is now 0, 1 successes, or at least counts of successes, and we want to be able to have the probability of the success depend on the covariates. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take some relationship with the covariates and then map it with this function f into a probability so that we can have those covariates influence what we expect the probability to be. Right? Again, f could be many, many things. Uh, we could also imagine flipping this around and putting it into other parameters, but in general, it's, a, it's kind of a procedure that, uh, that we can apply. Now, you can also imagine taking uh, multiple parameters and doing this trick. So you could take, say, so here we have kind of three effective parameters in the, the distribution. Um, and in the first two, we replace them with this deterministic relationship. So we have an F1 and an F2. They could be the same. They could be different. Right? So imagine having a gamma distribution where the uh, shape and the scale parameters are themselves functions of the covariates, right? And we could do, imagine all kinds of functional forms for what those functions would be. All right, so now that we have this kind of general framework in place, we can talk about explicit choices of those functions to give us a very, very wide diversity of models. And the first uh, choice that we'll make is a linear relationship. And this gives us the, uh, the infamous linear model. So the idea is that we're going to take this function and we're going to have two kind of meta parameters here. We're going to have an intercept alpha and a slope beta. And then we're going to have the output of this relationship just be the linear relationship between beta times x plus alpha. All right, so we take the covariates, we scale them with a the slope, we add an intercept, and then that we plug into some parameter in our uh, 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 regression density function. Right? Um, now, in general, we're going to have multiple covariates. And so we're going to have multiple slopes. And this becomes a multivariate equation 
where we take uh, this design matrix, which incorporates all of those covariates. Right? So the ith row of the, of the design matrix um, informs us as to uh, which covariate we're looking at, and the nth column tells us which data point we're looking at. So we take that entire matrix of covariates, multiply it by the slopes, and then add the intercept. Right? In matrix notation, this takes a nice clean form. We take the design matrix, we transpose it, multiply by the slopes, add the intercept. Right? Okay. Now in STAN, this gets implemented in a pretty straightforward fashion. So let's uh, look at this step by step. Right? So up here in the data block, we'll start with the number of covariates. Uh, then we have the number of samples. And then we have our, our real, uh, in this case, uh, variates. And then we have our design matrix. Right? So it's a matrix. It has uh, n covariate uh, rows. It has n sample or n data point columns. In the parameters block, we're going to have uh, a vector of slopes, one slope for every covariate. And then we're going to have a single alpha. Right? There's just one intercept for the whole thing. And then somewhere in the model block, we're going to construct this y tilde, where we take x transpose, so that little comma means transpose, so x uh, transpose beta to plus alpha, and this is going to give us a vector of size n. Right? So we're going to get an expected y for every individual, for every data point in our, in our design matrix. And then how we incorporate that into our model depends on what, our, what our, the rest of our model looks like. Um, so the simplest thing that we could do, or rather the most uh, common thing that you can imagine doing, is using this linear relationship in the mean of a Gaussian distribution. Right? So we always saw this as an example. Uh, so now we have some multivariate data y, and the mean of that data is going to be given by uh, x transpose beta plus alpha. And then the, inter the uh, noise is this homogeneous noise that doesn't depend on the covariates. Right? And this is the infamous general linear model. Right? This is the basis of linear regression. There's been 40, 50 years of study of this particular model. Um, and in STAN, it's really quite easy to implement. Right? So again, we have the same data block that we had before. Right? So it's exactly the same. We have the same parameters block, except we've added this, this sigma. Right? So we want this to be positive, so we add the lower equals zero constraint. And in the model, that likelihood is just given by y normal uh, distributed as a normal. We have the mean, which is x transpose beta plus alpha, and then we have that noise. Right? Now, what I haven't talked about is how to choose priors for any of these. So this is really an incomplete model right now. Now, in STAN, if you don't explicitly define priors, it's going to assume that they're uniform. Because mathematically, multiplying by uniform distribution is equivalent to not doing anything at all. Um, but uniform distributions aren't great. Uniform distributions tend to, ha tend to bias all of your parameters to really, really, really large values. Um, oftentimes, they're presented as being uh, non-informative, but they're actually quite informative. Right? They're really saying that infinity is an OK value, and rarely is infinity an OK value. Um, but prior, having reasonable priors are really important for linear regression and these general linear models, because you can run into some serious issues. If you have enough data, then things will tend to be OK. Right? And so we kind of typically think about having way more data points than number of parameters, and we're able to constrain the relationship really well. Right? So we're going to have this, this deterministic linear relationship, and then we're going to have the noise on top of that. But this need not be the case. Right? We could have less data points than parameters. And then we run to this issue of, co or sorry, if, if everything is, is, is nice and, and well-behaved, that our posterior is going to look nice and well behaved. All of our probability concentrates in a nice clean neighborhood, and that's easy to sample from. Right? So we can run STAN, it goes super fast, uh, and we can get the inferences we want. But this isn't the case where everything is well behaved and we have enough data. But we need not have enough data. Right? You can imagine having more parameters than data points, more, more covariates than data you were able to collect. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does lead to what's called a collinearity. And in a collinearity, there are many, many different linear relationships that are consistent with any particular measurement. And so that means our posterior is non-identified. In other words, all of our posterior probability concentrates not in a compact neighborhood, but rather in an a, a, a extended neighborhood that goes all the way out to infinity in both directions. Right? This doesn't integrate to one. It's not a well-defined distribution. And we also can't explore it with Stan, because Stan's going to have to go back to infinity, 
you know, from here, go up to infinity, back down to the other infinity, back, back. it's going to go back and forth. Now, Stan will actually try to do this. And one way of catching these non-identifiabilities is looking at your tree depth, which is the number of integration steps that we do. Um, and if that keeps hitting the boundary, oftentimes it's due to the fact that your posterior just goes off way, 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 way too far. Right? So to get around that, we need to define well-posed priors. Right? We need to have actual distributions that really quantify our assumptions about what's going on with these parameters before we've made the measurement. And the most natural thing to do for the general linear model is to have normal priors for the slopes and intercepts, right? Just a, a nice thing to do. Now, in general, this is going to be a multivariate normal because we have many slopes. And you can plug the intercept in there as well if you'd like. And they can all be correlated with each other. But in general, we don't have any information or any prior information as to why they would be correlated, right? And correlations add more information. So if we're going to be ignorant, then the most ignorant thing that we can say is that all of our slopes are uncorrelated. So this just uh, devolves into a product of independent normals. Um, and then comes down to the, to the choice of these two parameters. And the first thing we can say is, do we have any idea what sign the slopes will be, whether it be positive or negative? Sometimes they might. But most often we don't, right? We don't know where to expect the effect. And so we're typically going to set the mean to zero. And we're going to set the scale of all of the, the slopes to be the same. Um, this is very much helped out if you standardize all of your covariates ahead of time. Right? If the covariates all have the same variation, then a priori they should all have the same slopes. Right? We have no prior information to say that one slope should be larger than the other. And so what this reduces to is choosing one scale factor, omega. Right? And what you want to think about this as is what is the natural set of units that you're expecting the slope to be in? Right? Is it going to be in kilometers per second? Is it going to be in yen per year? Is it going to be in you know, uh, uh, kilograms per you know, meter squared? Right? Like what are the natural units that, that you expect your response to be in? Once you've defined that natural scale, then you can say multiply by 5 or 2 or 10 to give it a little bit of slack. And now you have a nice prior that really codifies. You expect it to be in this domain. And if it goes beyond that, something really weird is happening. Right? I mean, imagine that we're trying to infer the temperature of a planet. Right? We know the temperature of a planet can't be the temperature of the sun. Otherwise, it would be a star. Right? So we can say that you know, the upper bound on the temperature of, of, of the sun can, or of this planet can be a typical solar temperature. And that gives us a nice scale as to what to expect. Right? And this is usually something that's very easy to do once you sit down and think about your problem a little bit. Um, so we can do that for the slopes and the intercept. And then we have to deal with uh, the noise term. And we want to play a sim similar game here. It's mean zero, because we don't really have any idea where it would be otherwise. Um, and we're going to have some scale. Now, note here that we're not using a Gaussian, but a Cauchy. Uh, Cauchy is heavier tailed uh, than a Gaussian. And that's typically because we don't have as much information as to what the scale of the noise should be. Right? We can reason about the, the uh, deterministic relationship between the variates and the covariates. Oftentimes, we don't have any physical understanding of where the noise is coming from. And so what the half Cauchy does is it gives us this kind of decomposition. To the left of tau, we have approximately a flat distribution. And to the right of tau, we have approximately a flat distribution, but at a lower scale. Right? So what this essentially does is says, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between 0 and tau. But if I'm wrong, I'm not going to force me to stay below tau. If I'm completely wrong, I still have some probability of being able to jump up to a higher sigma. Right? So it's not as constraining as a Gaussian. And sometimes it's a lot uh, better to have. Um, if, you, if you can very strongly constrain uh, sigma to be below tau, then you can plug in a half Gaussian instead of a half Cauchy. Right? These are modeling choices that you have to make and play with and see how they work with, with your own model. OK, so, but if we take those nominal specifications, then we get a model that looks something like this. So again, we have the same data block as before. This isn't going to change that much as we, as we expand these models. And we have the same parameters block as before. We have the same likelihood as before. Only thing we've done now is actually added explicit priors. So again, I've chosen here kind of assuming that my covariates are scaled to be order 1. Then uh, I'd expect, you know, again, a typical variation of 1. So to be safe, I'm going to up that up by an order of magnitude and set a normal 0, 10 uh, for my slopes. Now, note in STAN, these are standard deviations and not variances, right? 
Um, so when you're translating from things like bugs, you have to be very, very careful to make sure that you're inverting and taking the square root. Um, so an alpha, again, is 0, 10. And then for the sigma, a Cauchy is 0, 10. So it's a little bit less informative than the two normals, but that's to be robust because we don't have as much information as to what the noise might be. Right? So that's your standard linear regression in STAN. Just a few lines, super easy to fit. Of course, we're not using STAN to do linear regression. There's lots of tools to do linear regression. We want to generalize and add a lot more structure. And to do that, we have to consider more complicated measurement models. We need to go beyond the Gaussian. And that's going to take us to general linear models. And the idea here is to have more complicated stochastic relationships, right? more complicated probabilist, uh, probability densities that we're going to use to model the relationship between the variates and the covariates. Um, and this is going to complicate matters, right? Because we can't use this linear relationship for all parameters. If you have some distribution that has a constrained parameter between A and B, then the linear relationship isn't going to work. We can't just plug that in. Because the linear relationship is valid from minus infinity to infinity, right? And so you're going to get a bunch of invalid values, right? Imagine trying to use that linear relationship to model a noise term. You're going to get a lot of negative noises, which don't make any sense. So what we need to do is somehow take this linear relationship and map it so it matches the constraint that we expect from the distribution. And this is where the generalization comes in. We're going to keep that linearity, but we're going to add a map to make sure that we can fit it into any distribution we want. And so in general, we're going to have some kind of map that does that constraining, right? If we expect something between A and B, we need some map that's going to take a minus infinity to infinity and collapse it down to A, B. Um, and this is what's called a link function in statistics. Uh, although we have to be a little bit careful with the notation, right? So in this case, we're thinking about G as doing the map from the unconstrained space to the constrained space. Unfortunately, due to some weird statistical issues, back in the day, they were focused on the other way. And so the names of all of these link functions are not named by the map from the linear space to the, to the constrained space, rather the constrained space to the linear space. In other words, they're going to be named after the inverse of the functions that we want to use. Um, this is a little bit unfortunate, um, but we'll have to keep it in mind because the, the statistical literature is very set on, the, on that nomenclature. Um, so for example, let's say that we wanted to model a positive parameter, like the noise in uh, the, the Gaussian, or perhaps a rate uh, parameter for Poisson. Right? We can't just take the linear relationship, but we can wrap it in an exponential. Because an exponential will take something that is defined on minus infinity to infinity and reduce it to something that's defined on zero infinity. Now, per this weird naming convention, we call this function the log link function. Right? Even though it's the exponential, it's really the inverse that gets the name. All right? Um, and the log link function looks something like this. For very, very small values of the linear output, we get essentially zero. And for very, very large outputs of the linear uh, relationship, we get essentially infinity. Right, and we get this kind of very, very rapid growth in the middle. Um, another very common constraint that we see is to a probability. Right? So you imagine doing a, a Bernoulli experiment or, or a binomial experiment or a negative binomial experiment. Uh, you're going to get success or failure, and we want to determine that success or failure by the probability. So the probability has to be between 0 and 1, and a natural way of doing that is with the logistic function. So the logistic function maps minus infinity to infinity to this 0, 1 interval that we need. And its inverse function is called the logit, uh, which is log of uh, 1 over uh, p of 1 minus p. Right? Um, so we call this the logit link function. And it looks something like this. Um, so again, we have the linear relationship on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the output. So you can see for very, very small values of the linear output, we saturate at 0. For very, very large outputs, we saturate at 1. And then in the middle, basically around zero, we get this turnover, the sigmoidal shape. Right? And this is typically how we're going to model probabilities, the classification, um, all kinds of very wonderful things that we can do with this uh, link function. Um, so for example, we can take that logistic link function and plug it into a Bernoulli distribution. Right? So our data is going to be a bunch of zero ones. We've, say, um, had some website data, and we've, we've gotten successes or failures uh, on clicks or you know, some kind of interaction that you wanted. And we have a bunch of covariates measuring, say, the behavior of that user or prior information about that user. And we want to model that with this logistic regression. So we're going to take 
those covariates, multiply them by the slopes, add the intercept, take that whole thing, swallow it up into a logistic function. That's going to give us a probability, which we can then use to predict what the uh, output would be, right? whether we're going to get a success or a failure. Right? And again, this is the infamous logistic regression, which is all over these days. Right? Everyone loves, loves using these things. But they're really just a simple general linear model. Um, now in Stan, that gets implemented in a very, very nice, clean way. So again, we have the same data that we did before. The only difference is that now we're going to add a constraint to the Ys, because these are going to be successes or failures. Right? So we're going to code that with an integer that's either 0 or 1. And by adding this constraint here, for whatever reason, we, we miscoded the data, say by doing 1, 2, or 3, 4, or anything, or minus 1, 1, then we would know we'd have a conflict. Right? So Stan expects this to be 0, 1. So we have this nice... A guarantee of that. Um, in the parameters block, we have the same vector of slopes, we have the same intercept, but we don't need the noise anymore because there's no noise term in, in, a, in a Bernoulli. Um, this might be a limitation, right? Because it actually, it, we don't have as much uh, freedom to model that relationship. Um, that's where things like negative binomial comes in, which gives us another parameter to play with. Um, and then in the model itself, uh, we have uh, the likelihood, right? So uh, note we have the Bernoulli, for the success probability of the Bernoulli, we're going to take the linear relationship, again, x transpose beta plus alpha, uh, and then we're going to plug it into the inverse logit function, which is the logistic. Um, that gives us a probability. That we can plug that into the Bernoulli function, um, and then we get the uh, slope, um, uh, the, sorry, the priors on the slope and the intercept. Right? So again, another nice, simple model that's easy, really easy to code up in Stan. Um, Right. Uh, so one interesting thing that happens down here, when you actually write out the Bernoulli density function, and then you compose it with this uh, inverse logit function, you get a lot of cancellations. These are, for, they're, in some sense, these are very, very compatible, the distribution with the, the link function. Um, and those cancellations avoid a lot of unnecessary computation. They also make it uh, more numerically stable. So if you could do that analytically, it would be a lot better uh, to have in Stan. And so we in fact, done that for you. And so instead of trying to do the inverse logit map yourself and then plug it into a Bernoulli, we have the Bernoulli logit distribution function where you just plug in the linear relationship. We'll take care of doing the, log the inverse logit transform and then plugging it in to the normal Bernoulli. Right? So you get that map taken care of for you. All you have to do is model the linear part of the, of the model. Right? Um, so you're always going to want to use those. Uh, whenever we have them available, where we automatically do the link function, you're going to want to do it because it's going to be faster and it's going to be much more numerically stable. OK, um, so that's logistic regression. We could also do a Poissonian regression. Right? So say our data is now counts. Um, and we need to be able to model the rate function, which is positive. So we're going to want to use the log link function. Right? Again, we're going to take the linear relationship. We're going to map it through the exponential. This gives us a positive rate function that we can plug into a Poisson, which gives us the counts we want. Um, and so in the stand model, again, nice to cl uh, clean code. We have our data block, our parameters block, very familiar from before. And the only difference down here is that we have a Poisson. We have the exponential link function. Uh, but the uh, priors on alpha and beta are the same, and the linear relationship is the same. Right? Uh, oh, I guess there is a small change up here that we don't need the upper bound of 1 anymore. Right, because it's positive data. It's not just zero one successes. Um, okay. Uh, now again, there's a lot of cancellations if you look analytically at what happens when you take an exponential and plug it into the Poisson density function. So we've played the same trick uh, and done that for you. So we have the Poisson underscore log density function, which you can really think about as a general linear model density function. So you plug in this linear relationship. Right? And then we'll take care of doing, uh, doing the, the link function, mapping it to a positive value, and then evaluating the Poisson density. Right? So these are your friend. Um, we have a few more of them. We have one for uh, binomial distribution, the negative binomial distribution. And kind of, uh, we consider adding them as we get more and more users interested in other uh, general linear models. So if there's some general linear model that you're using a lot, that you find yourself you know, having to code by yourself, and you'd like it to have as part of Stan, you can always op open up an issue uh, to make a feature request. Right? This is, it's good information for us to have, uh, knowing what people are using and what people might want. OK. So that was the basics of regression. 
linear and general linear uh, modeling, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's specifying your data, your parameters, uh, and then you just build some, some relationship between them. We have, uh, in Stan, you have the option of lots and lots of distribution functions, and if you just keep taking these linear relationships and plugging them into a link function, you get a lot, I mean, not quite an infinitude, but you know, hundreds if not thousands of models that you could play with to try to, to model your, your data. Um, and of course, you can imagine chaining these together, right, to have whole, whole uh, sets of likelihoods that become more and more complex, but each component is one of these simple general linear models. So all kinds of fun things that can be done, even up until this point. Um, but, right, so uh, one of the assumptions, however, that's been made here, that will be very limiting in application, is that all of the data are the same. Right? You'll notice we've treated all of these covariates, all of these independent measurements as somehow equal, equivalent to each other. There's no difference between them. And that's going to be a real limiting assumption in practice. Because we know we're never really, I mean, when was the last time you had a data set that took one person in one environment, one context, and complete that, get that completely the same? Right? There was no variation at all. It doesn't happen, right? It, you just can't do that. You're measuring different individuals, or you're measuring the same individual in a different circumstance, right? The environment's changing. And that's going to mean the response is going to change. And so one of the things we have to tackle in, in building these really complex models is how do we deal with a population that's kind of the same, but not exactly the same, right? How can we generalize these models so that we're not just talking about equivalent measurements, but are equivalent individuals in the population, uh, but, but uh, similar uh, individuals in the population. And that is where hierarchical models come in. So things are going to get really complicated really quickly, and I apologize for that, but some of these concepts are a little bit wacky. So I'm going to try to have a lot of examples to explain what I mean. And again, if things become uh, not clear or confusing, please uh, uh, raise a hand or, or give me a shout. Uh, to let me know, uh, because as we go, if, if we kind of miss out on the interpretation of something, then it's going to limit what we can do uh, going forward. Okay, so again, the idea here is that we have a population of individuals, right? Now, this might be actual people, or it could just be different data points. It could be the same person at different times. You know, it could be however you imagine it, right? You have n data points, and they form some population. And the idea is that we have to make some choice of how we're going to treat this population, right? We can assume that they're all the same and use one set of parameters to model everything. And that's essentially the assumption that we've made so far today, right? All of the models that I had before assumed all of these data points were equivalent to each other. And that's nice and clean. It's easy to write a model that way, but you have the risk of bias, right? Because we know there is going to be at least some small variation amongst these data points. And because we're ignoring that, we're, not, we're going to have biased estimation, right? Our model isn't going to be able to capture what's actually happening. Um, and that bias might be small, in which case it's okay to use this kind of assumption. But that bias can, that bias can be really, really big, right? Imagine you're doing some kind of medical experiment and you're grouping uh, men and women together at this, uh, into one big population. This happens all the time because there's not enough data for clinical trials. But men and women have very, very different responses to drugs, right? The, the, the physiological systems are very, very different. And there's been a lot of problems recently where uh, because dosing has been determined by a mostly male population, there's all kinds of weird side effects for women taking the same medication, right? There are real serious issues when you assume that the data are all equivalent. So the only alternative that we have right now, oh, sorry, before getting into the alternative, let's just actually think about how this would be in STAN, right? And this is just the model that we saw before. So we have uh, the number of co uh, the data, right, with the covariates, the individuals, the, the uh, success counts, and the uh, design matrix. And then the parameters block, we have a single intercept, right? We have a single set of slopes and a single intercept that we use for our entire model, right? So for every, in, every n, the same slope and the same intercept, right? Um, now, from here going on for the rest of the talk, I'm going to assume constant slopes for everyone and I'm just going to talk about variations in the intercept. There's no reason we, why we can't talk about having variations in the slopes. It's just I'm not going to have enough space to write down models that allow both of them to vary. Right? So just, just for ease of presentation, we're going to focus on the intercepts varying, um, but the, the same ideas can be applied to any parameter you might have. 
Okay, so nice simple model assumes what we call complete pooling, right? Every individual has the same intercepts. Now the opposite of this, the alternative that we could do is to assume that every individual is different. So we're gonna have to assign a different parameter to every individual in the population. Now this completely gets rid of the bias, but now we have very, very high variance because we have very little data for every parameter, right? We can't use data that goes to one of the individuals to inform the parameters on the other individual. So we've gone from having high bias and low variance to having high uh, variance and low bias. Now this is also easy to write up in STAN. Right, so again we have the, uh, the data, we have uh, the parameters, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a separate slope for every individual in the population. Right, so we've gone from having I plus one parameters to I plus N parameters. And you can imagine this being a lot of parameters. Um, so we go in, down into the model block, and now this has a slight different interpretation because instead of having one alpha that gets broadcast to every individual, we're going to have N alphas, right? Everyone gets their own individualized parameter. Um, and you can imagine this is gonna be really hard to fit because we've gone from having more data than parameters to now having more parameters than data. Now the priors matter, uh, we're gonna have to deal with these collinearities, things become a lot more challenging. Now, ideally, we would be able to go somewhere in between these two extremes because in, in, in most problems, we know that there's some relationship between the individuals um, but they do have some level of individuality, right? It, it's not the, either of these two extremes. It's something in the middle. We need a compromise. And the way you can imagine trying to implement that compromise is in an iterative fashion. So imagine that we start off by fitting all of the individuals separately. So we give everyone their own parameters, and we run independent fits on all of them. Some of the individuals have lots of data, and hence, we are able to constrain their parameters really well. That corresponds to the small circles, right? Very little uncertainty. Some of the individuals have, have not a lot of data, so we have large uncertainties, right? That corresponds to the large circles. So we, we do the individual fits first. Then we take those individual fits and we use them to fit a population distribution, right? So we're going to look at the distribution of thetas and use that to fit some, some functional form, right? So now we're thinking about two things. There's the individuals, and then there's how those individual parameters are distributed across the entire population of our, of our data set. Right? And so now we can take that population distribution and use it to refit the individuals. Right? Now we can use that as a regularizer, right? as a prior, and go back and do the fits again. That's gonna have two effects. One is it's gonna drag all of our fits towards the mean of the population. Right? It's going to add a little bit of bias, but it substantially reduces the variance of most of those fits, especially the fits that had very little data. Right? If, the, if you look carefully, you can see that those individuals with very small uncertainties, don't bi they don't get biased all that much. But those individuals with lots of uncertainty, they get biased a lot, and their variance reduces quite a bit. Right? So you can see uh, there's, there's, there's some variation there. And so generally what, what this idea does, if we model not just the individuals, but also the population, then what we're gonna get is an automatic trade-off between bias and variance. And that's gonna minimize the overall total error. Right, and we're talking about a pretty substantial reduction in error. So this has the potential to drastically improve our fits. Right, but the real key to doing that is to have the individual parameters and then have this population distribution that we fit at the same time. Right, so in practice, we're not gonna do it this, in this iterative fashion. We're just gonna refine everything in the model and then run the model all at once. The only challenge then is to figure out what was that model gonna look like? What do I mean by a population distribution and how does it relate to the individual parameters? And fortunately, this is where things are gonna get a little bit weird because we need to consider what we mean by a population and that's gonna have very, very strong constraints on what distributions we can use. And the main feature we have to think about is this thing called exchangeability. Now, if the uh, individuals in the population were all completely different, right, or all independent, we understand how that works, right? We have this, this independence, and so we can take any of them, and they're all not related to anyone else. Now, we want to loosen that a little bit, but we still want to have some similar notion, 
because we don't have any way to discriminate between the individuals in the population. Right? If I gave you n data points, and I pr then I, I re-permuted all of, uh, of those data points and gave it to you again, those data sets are going to look the same to you. Right? You have no idea who, what, what individual A is versus individual B. They're just arbitrary labels. And so the, the feature that we want to uh, impose upon this population is this idea of exchangeability, that we can permute any of these individuals. Right? I can flip those two individuals, and the model still looks the same. Right? The population still looks the same. Or I can flip those two. Right? You can't tell the difference between any of those. Now, this is a subtle constraint. Um, and it's, it's weaker than independence, but it's still pretty strong, and it still affects what we can do. Um, Okay, so this is exchangeability if the, if the individuals in the population are all indistinguishable from each other. Right? I can always take any of the two individuals and flip them around. Um, things become a little bit more subtle when we have a discriminating covariate. So far I've talked about all these covariates as being these continuous things we multiply a slope by. But imagine that you have something like income status in four brackets. Right? That's not something you can multiply a slope by, but we can use it to separate the population up into four groups. Right, so here I'm going to consider just a binary classifier. It splits our population into these two subpopulations. Now, I can't arbitrarily exchange any two individuals anymore. Because right? if I take somebody with a dark red and a light red coding and try to flip them, you can tell something is different. Right? The, number, the population sizes have changed, for example. So the only thing, so we can't do that. Right? What we can do is exchange individuals uh, uh, within the same population. Oops. Right, so we can exchange in individuals within the same population. So I can exchange a light red for a light red and a dark red for a dark red. Right? And what this really means is that these two populations, these two groups, become exchangeable. Right? If I call light red 0 and dark red 1, that's equivalent to calling dark red 0 and light red 1. Right? So I'm not going to be changing two individuals anymore. I'm going to be changing the whole groups. That kind of makes sense? It's subtle, but it's going to have really, really big consequences on the kind of models we write. Um, OK. So, and then, of course, we can have an arbitrary number of these discriminating covariates. So for example, let's say I have three binary covariates that split my population up into two groups. Um, the first one might split it up into tho those two subpopulations. Um, the second one into those two subpopulations. Right? We get different discrimination. Um, and they might need not have the same size, right? This isn't going to be always some perfect split of population into, into n over 2 and n over 2. We can have most of the individuals be in one pop, uh, group and uh, just a few in the other group, right? So lots of potential ways of having this kind of discrimination of our population. Okay, now here's the really important part. If we have a population that's exchangeable, either all of the individuals are exchangeable or just those groups are exchangeable, then it has a very strong con uh, constraint on the kind of model we can write. The only kind of probability distribution that's compatible with exchangeability has to have this form. Right? So any population distribution that we write down has to be written as a mixture of some local distribution, so the, some distribution uh, for the individual parameters given some hyperparameters, and then some hyperprior for those parameters. Right? It always has to have this conditional breakdown. This is called Definetti's theorem, and it's really hard to get around this. Right? But this actually has some nice benefits, because it means that if we want to be able to define a population, all we have to do is construct a conditional distribution that looks like this. Um, now, if we introduce data, then we get a model that looks like this. Right? Because the data is just going to inform the individual parameters. So the data about group one just informs the parameters about group one. And then we have the population distribution that relates all of the groups together, and then we have the hyperprior. Right? So all of the hierarchical models that we're going to build are going to have this form. It's going to have this very, very distinct conditional form. And sometimes it's easier to look at that graphically. Right? So that same uh, equation has this similar form. We have the uh, data up here. We have the individual parameters up here. right? So every group gets their own parameters. Um, or every individual gets their own parameters if we don't have any classification into groups. And then all of those parameters share the same hyperparameters. Right? 
And you can see how this is uh, exchangeable, because if I take, say, this group and that group and flip them, the model still looks the same. Right? And so it, you can kind of see visually that it has that permutation symmetry to it. And, you, and if you imagine, you know, you can't add extra parameters to, say, you know, the nth individual, because then you can no longer flip things around. Right? Every group has to have the same set of parameters. And then what's really cool is that once we have this kind of distribution, we're going to get sharing of information. So even though the data up here only directly connects to the parameters for, for that individual, if we use that data to inform what the, hyper, the population parameters are, then those population parameters are going to inform all of the thetas. Right, so this theta n learns from not only the nth data, but also the first data through that path, as well as the, any kind of intermediate data. It always goes from here down into uh, the population parameters, then feeds back up into the parameters again. Right? And so when we fit this together, what we get is this partial pooling. We get some uh, uh, bias of the parameters towards each other, but not so much that we get a bad fit. Right? It all happens dynamically with the data. That kind of makes sense? Any questions? Cool. All right, and we're going to have lots of stand code to hopefully make this more concrete. OK, now in terms of an actual population distribution, right, we've got to choose this pi of theta n given phi. You can imagine lots and lots of potential choices for that. Um, but the one we're going to use almost entirely is a Gaussian population distribution. So you can have whatever likelihood you want, right? The actual measurement model could be very, very complex. But when it comes to the hierarchical structure, we're going to assume that these parameters are drawn with a mean mu and some standard deviation sigma. And then there's going to be a hyper prior for mu and a hyper prior for sigma. Um, now, one of the important things to keep in mind here is that those hyper priors are really, really, really important. Because if you don't set them to something reasonable, you get really weird fits. And so to see how that is, let's consider perhaps one of the most pathological priors you can use in a hierarchical model, which is a uniform prior. So we're going to say, you know, naively we want to be ignorant, and so we don't want to say that one value of sigma is better than any other. Right? Now this sounds nice and good, but remember what it means. If I give you any value of theta, there's infinitely more probability that you're above that value than below it. In other words, this prior actually puts a lot of probability mass at really, really high values of sigma. Well, what happens then? Well, when sigma is really big, a normal distribution looks like a uniform, right? Just imagine taking a normal and making it wider and wider and wider and wider and wider, right? It turns into a, norm, a uniform distribution. And if you have a uniform distribution for the population, well, then your model just turns into a bunch of IID likelihoods. Right? You, you go back into this model where every individual has their own parameters. There's no pooling at all. And so if you choose a uniform prior, it takes an incredible amount of data to have any kind of pooling whatsoever. All right? and, and for most models where you don't have that much data, you end up get it reducing to uh, uh, the no pooling model. Um, and so you don't actually take advantage of the hierarchical structure. Right? So you have to have some kind of prior that at least keeps you in a region where the data can inform how much pooling you should have. Um, and again, we're going to go back to our, our, our favorite half Cauchy distribution, where we have a mean of zero, um, and we have some scale tau that informs us kind of how small sigma should be. And usually we have some information as to what kind of variation we expect in the population. Right? Um, so for example, in that medical case where we had some drug and we want to know how it affects um, uh, uh, women and men, um, we can look at the physiological science to understand just, you know, how much can, for example, hormones affect a particular pathway using kind of our known uh, uh, science. Now, it doesn't have to be exact. We just need to be able to constrain this with some reasonable value. Right? So this is really, really important that you have proper priors on the hierarchical models. Otherwise, you lose all of the power. OK. So that's the general hierarchical model uh, introduction. But now let's talk about general linear hierarchical models, right? Because those general linear models we wrote tend to work really well with hierarchical structure. These are really, really naturally compatible ideas. And so they can really allow us to take those general linear models and make them all the more general. So again, remember, our general linear model is going to have some form like this, where we have some choice of density function. And then one, at least one of those parameters is going to get this linear relationship mapped into it with a link function. Right, so we start with the linear relationship between the, with the covariate, 
hit it with a link function, and then that goes in to inform the stochastic relationship. What, uh, right, and so again, this assumed that all the individuals were the same, because we had one slope and one intercept for every individual, right? But there's gonna be variation in the population, so what do we have to do? We have to have a separate slope and a separate intercept for every individual in the population, right? So we now we have to write, write this separately for every n. That's gonna be hard to fit, because we don't have a lot of n's here, right? We don't have a lot of individuals, so what do we do? We make it hierarchical. So we make uh, the slopes come from some normal distribution with some mean and some potential covariance. And then we have the intercepts come from uh, a mean, uh, some normal distribution with a mean and some uh, intercepts, or some, sorry, some standard deviation, right? And what's really cool is that regardless of the choice of pi and regardless of the choice of g, we have the same hierarchical model, right? So once we know how to code one hierarchical model, we can start applying it to any general linear model. Um, so in this case, our, our graphical interpretation is going to be a little bit more different. It's the same thing, but basically, instead of having one set of parameters here, we're going to have two, right? So our theta really decomposes into a beta and an alpha, and then we have a whole bunch of hyperpriors that we have to set. Uh, and so uh, the model in, would look something like this in the end. Okay, so uh, we have the same data as before, right? In the parameters block, we're going to have our, our vector of slopes beta. We're going to have a separate alpha for every individual in the population. We're going to have a mean for the hierarchical model, and we're going to have a standard deviation for the hierarchical model. Right? These are new parameters that we're going to fit. If the individual alphas are very, very different, then the model will learn that sigma should be very big. Whereas if they're very, very similar, the model will learn that sigma should be very, very small, and that'll help regularize everything to get more statistical power for every, every measurement. Now when it comes down to the model, we have uh, the beta and the alpha, uh, beta as before. Now the prior for alpha, instead of just being normal 0, 10, now it's normal with the mean being the hierarchical mean and the standard deviation being the hierarchical standard deviation. Right? So this says that every alpha, there's n of them, comes from this population. We right? really are drawing from a distribution, a population distribution. And then we have hyperpriors on the mean and the standard deviation of that population. Um, so here I've chosen normal 0, 10 and a Cauchy 0, 10. Again, I've kind of rescaled everything to have one being the expected response and then given it a little bit of slack. Um, in your case, you might not have that kind of scaling, so you have to be careful and really think and make sure that these are reasonable. Right? This, really, this prior really says that I don't expect the intercepts to change by more than one unit across the population. Uh, should we get a mic? Oh, well, just for the recording. So in this code, uh, this Cauchy may have Cauchy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. So absolutely, thanks for, for reminding me about that. Um, so I did not specifically say half Cauchy here. But because sigma, oh, okay. So yes, yes, sorry. Uh, sigma should have a lower equal zero bound here. I think I have that in the rest of the models. Um, but we want sigma to be positive because if we try to plug in... Um, uh, sigma alpha negative here, bad things are going to happen. Um, so yeah, you want real low e lower, lower equals zero here, I apologize. Um, and then once you have that lower bound, that automatically guarantees that this Cauchy is a half Cauchy. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, the position of the size of vector is, uh, is it long? Uh, I and N is uh, behind vector. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I wrote these really quickly. Um, yes, okay, so the proper notation is that these i should be over here, this n should be over here, right? So an array you define uh, with the, the size on the right, but a vector in a matrix. So like a matrix here, you can see the size on the left here, and the same should be true for the vectors. Sorry, these started off all as arrays, and I had to change them after the fact. Um, right, so one cool thing about Stan is that we have a really good parser, and if you tried to run this model, it would tell you that all of these things are wrong. And it would, actually be very, it would give line numbers and very informative messages of, of what's going on. Um, so don't be like me. Run it through the parser and actually get something that works. Uh, okay, but provided you fix all of those things, uh, then the model works fine. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Right. Uh, so, so we get the, the beta and the alpha, 
and then we just plug it in to this thing, right? And so what, what's essentially happening is that we get our separate alpha for every individual, the same slopes for every individual, um, and then those alphas get pulled together by this distribution here. Right? Again, if, you, if, you, if we see that these slopes, the intercepts are all very, very different, then this sigma alpha will get big to incorporate a wide population distribution that will allow all the individuals to have the, the variability that they need. But if uh, all of the intercepts end up being very close to each other, if there really isn't that much differentiation in the data, then sigma alpha will get really, really small, and we'll see a collapse, right? We'll see a, a, a contraction of the population distribution. And that's exactly what we want. Okay, um, so this is when, this is in the case where we don't have any of those discriminating covariates, right? We have no labels on the population that split it up into subpopulations. Things get a little bit more interesting uh, when we have those discriminating covariates. Because now what we have to do is instead of having n intercepts, we're going to have n subgroup intercepts. Right? So for example, I have like income bracket, and there's four different groups of income bracket. That means I'm going to have four subpopulations, and it's only those subpopulations that get an intercept. Now this becomes a little bit more complicated because in order to implement the model, we need a mapping. We need this individual to subgroup mapping here. And what this does is I can plug in an individual n, and it will tell me which subgroup that individual belonged to. So that down here, I can create a, a vector of alpha, uh, what do I call it, uh, alpha individual, and I just loop through the individuals, figuring out which slope they belong, or which, inter which subgroup they belong to, so I can pull out the right slope, and that fills out this vector. Right, so down here in the likelihood, I do x uh, transpose times beta plus this long vector of the individual slopes. Right, so I'm mapping all the subgroups of the individuals automatically so that I can use the same likelihood as I did before. Right, you could also do this by just looping over individuals and have y of n uh, uh, distributed as Bernoulli logic, x of n times beta plus alpha subgroup of n. If you wanted to, this is a little bit more efficient. Um, and then the hierarchical part is exactly the same. So we have the uh, uh, Gaussian population distribution with mu alpha and sigma alpha, only now instead of having n uh, components in the population, we have n some group. Right? So it tends to be much, much smaller. Um, and of course, there's the same problems. That should be lower or equal zero. Um, those size uh, declarations should be on the left. Okay, all make sense? Um, so one of the trickiest things is being able to discriminate between when you have individual exchangeability and the subgroup exchangeability. So you always want to think about if, you know, how many groups do you have? That's going to be the number of intercepts that you have. Right? Now that all, that's all nice and clean when you have one discriminating covariate, right? when you just have, say, income bracket, and there's nothing else that tells the population apart. Things become a lot more complicated when we have many of those covariates. And this is what we call a multi-level model. And so the idea is that we don't just have one hierarchical model, we actually have many hierarchical models. And they all contribute to the slopes. I'm sorry, to the intercepts. So what we have here is that we have you know, this, this same model that we had before, only when we're calculating the nth intercept, we have to include an intercept effect from every possible covariate. Right? So we, uh, imagine our groups are income, uh, income bracket, education status, and uh, geography, like so where, where in the country you might be from. Every one of those effects, every one of those, those, those subgroups is going to give me an intercept, right? I, my slope will change depending on what income bracket I have. My slope will change depending on where I'm from geographically. The slope will change depending on which education status I have. And we want to incorporate all of those together, right? So we do that by modeling slopes or intercepts uh, for every uh, level and then just adding them all together. Right? And we really do get these kind of separate uh, hierarchical models. So graphically, that'll look something like this. Should I see a little bit more complication? Uh, we have the data, again, for every individual. Every individual gets an, a slope and an intercept. But those have to be comprised of these three hierarchical models down here. So there's one hierarchical model uh, for the first covariate. And here I'm taking the full generality where the slopes and the, the intercepts could, could change. There's the second hierarchical model here and the third hierarchical model here. Um, and I'm assuming these are binary classifiers, so they always split the population into two so that we get one set of slopes and intercepts 
another set of slopes and intercepts. All right, so we get six altogether, and somehow we have to go through for every one of these individuals and aggregate them over the different levels. All right, so the code's going to have to do something like this. So imagine that we want to calculate the slope and intercepts for the first individual. We go through and say, okay, they belong to the C, C1 equals zero. So let's grab those slopes and intercepts. They belong to C2 equals one. So we grab those slopes and intercepts. Um, and the same for the C3 equals zero. Grab those. Add them all up, and that gives us an effective beta and an effective alpha. Um, and then you just repeat this process over and over again. For the next individual, you do the same thing, looping over all of the levels in your model, and then you go until you've done that for every individual. Right? And of course, that's going to change. Right? Every individual is going to have separate uh, contributions, and so they're all going to have separate slopes in the end. Um, right, so again, let's take this case where we have these binary classifiers. We're going to have, uh, for every uh, subgroup, um, two, two intercepts, one intercept for C1 uh, one equals 0, one intercept for C1 uh, one equals 1, and then those two slopes then have a hierarchical structure to them, right? And that just repeats for every level. So for C1, C2, and C3, you all get the slopes. And again, the code looks something like starting at alpha n equals uh, alpha n, we just figure out, okay, it belongs to the zero group, grab the zero slope. It belongs to the one group, grab the one slope. Zero group, zero slope, right? And then add those all together, and that gives the, sorry, intercept. And that gives the intercept for the nth individual. Generally make sense? Okay. Oh, yep. Wait, the... multi-level model, mm -hmm. I think we assume the same coefficient for within a group, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. because within the group, we don't have any information to mm. say why, why the correction would be yeah. different. So if, if that's the case, isn't it also possible to model by, uh, by let, letting those classifiers as the additional covariates, such as this, it takes one, if this belongs to group one, mm -hmm. group two, group three, then the, we define Estimated coefficient as the estimated parameter of coefficients as the uh, that covariates. Uh, do you mean having like interactions between the covariates? Not interaction, but it's it's, it's only about intercept. Then oh yeah, so this could this could also for the slopes. Yes. Or any other parameter that you. If care it's about. slope, probably we have to take the interaction between the covariate and the classifier variable. But well, so I mean, oh no, oh no, um, I see what you're saying. Um, yes, so if you're doing this for the slopes, you have to break up the design matrix yeah. into the subpopulations. And so it becomes, this is one of the reasons why it's easier to do it for the intercepts, is that you can leave the design matrix as, as the same. And in fact, in statistics, it, that's how it's most often done. Um, in, in statistics, they call the hierarchical parameters uh, random effects, because they, they depend on the population, and the parameters that don't change, fixed effects. And this kind of model where you keep the slopes constant and allow the intercepts to vary is called a mixed effects model. Um, that changes, unfortunately, if you go to the econometrician literature, the name switch, which is really annoying. So they mean the complete opposite thing that the other one did. Um, but it, yeah, so, so in general, the slopes are assumed to be constant, but it doesn't have to be, right? It's just when it does, you have to tweak the design matrix and things become a little bit more complicated. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it, I yeah. Think it did. Yeah. I, I, I would show you a model, but it would take a lot of space and probably wouldn't fit on this page. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> you can see things are getting a little more complicated. Um, so, can you guys read that at all? Uh, so it's, it's going to be hard to make this any, any, any bigger. Um, but let's just look at the shapes. Uh, so can I... Okay. So uh, there's the data block up here. And if you look carefully, you can see there's a design matrix and the number of covariates, the number of individuals. That hasn't changed. What has changed is that for every discriminating covariate, we're going to have a number of groups. The number of they each have their own number of subgroups. And then they're all going to have their own unique mapping that tells me for the nth individual which subgroup corresponding to that covariate do they map to. Right? So for every co discriminating covariate, I'm going to have a number of subgroups and a mapping. 
So that's just like before, only I've copied it three times. In the parameters block, it's the beta again. And for every one of, the, of these discriminating covariates, I'm going to have a vector of, uh, of intercepts. Again, the size is on the wrong place. I apologize. Um, and then we're going to have hierarchical mean and a hierarchical standard deviation. Right? That, so that's just getting repeated three times. In the model, in the prior section, you can see that we have uh, this, just a hierarchical model for all, th just copied three times for the three covariates. But what we have to do up here is this aggregation. So for the nth individual, I'm computing the nth intercept as the intercept contribution from the first covariate, the second covariate, and the third covariate. Right? So I'm just looping over all of them, grabbing what it is. Uh, that gives me, it's summing them together. That gives me the individual intercepts that I can plug into the same likelihood that I had before. Right? So it's the same model that I had on the previous slide. I'm just copying a bunch of things over and over again. And you can imagine, as this gets bigger and bigger, this is going to get a little bit ungainly. So you can imagine making the number of discriminating covariates of, 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 of thing, uh, uh, data uh, and then uh, making all of this multivariate. Right? So there's all kinds of tricks you can do uh, with that. OK, but does gen the general form make sense? OK, good. So it, it's relatively straightforward. Once you get in the habit of kind of these mappings and um, uh, how to kind of construct these multi-layers multi, multi in the model, um, things are pretty straightforward right? to implement. Things are a lot harder to actually run. And this gets into the more pathological features of these models. Um, they really push Markov chain of Monte Carlo to its limits. And if you're not careful, you can end up getting really biased results. So what I want to talk about now is why these models are hard to fit and some of the things that we have to do to ensure that we get a good fit. Okay. So to demonstrate the pathologies, I'm going to use uh, radford Neal's funnel distribution. And this is just a really, really simple hierarchical model uh, where we've taken the log of the... Uh, of the hierarchical standard deviation, right? So this phi is really uh, the log of sigma that we had before. Um, so I've also taken the mean to be zero, so we're just going to ignore the mean altogether. And so you can see that we have the theta n's, and for every theta n, it's distributed at normal zero, e to the minus phi. Um, and then the hyperprior is just a normal, right? Cool? All right, now, the, the kind of the difficulty of this should become very clear once we plot the density. Right, so recall that when phi gets small, when the population standard deviation gets small, it's going to allow all of these parameters to collapse in on themselves, right? because the population distribution is really, really narrow. So we get this very, very thin neck. But then when phi is large, that causes a large population deviation, and that allows all the parameters to expand out. And so you get this very, very characteristic funnel density. Um, and you can see there's going to be some issues, right? Like that, that neck is really, really, really thin. In particular, let's imagine what the Markov chain has to sample. The Markov chain is going to be looking for probability mass, right? It wants to find the typical set. So probability mass is going to have two contributions, when there's large density and when there's large volume. Down here in the neck of the funnel, there's very, very high density, but relatively small volume, right? Because we're really concentrating that density in a smaller and smaller area. But up top, we might have lower density, but there's a lot of volume out there. Right? Eventually it caps off, but there's some kind of balance between those two regions. And so the typical set actually looks something like this. It looks like a bike seat or a tier. And the problem is that your Markov chain has to be able to go from this really, really narrow region down here to this wider region up here. And you can imagine the, the, the difficulties. Right? This would need a large step size. This needs a really, really small step size. There's not going to be one step size that works well for both regions. And so it's the exploration of this narrow region down here that causes problems. And in fact, this narrow region down here, that's the kind of pinch in the typical set that I motivated earlier. So that plot of a Markov chain getting stuck, that came exactly from taking this funnel distribution and trying to run it with Stan. All right? It's exactly these, these hierarchical priors that cause this problem. Fortunately, there's another way to do this. There is another way to implement these models that avoids this kind of pathology. 
And the idea is that instead of trying to sample the theta n's and the phi at the same time, we're going to use an auxiliary parameter. So we're going to use this uh, sigma tilde, and we're going to say that it's normal 0, 1, right? completely independent of what phi is. And the reason we can do that is that we can always reconstruct a Gaussian variate from another Gaussian variate. So if theta tilde is normal 0, 1, I can recover theta by just multiplying by the standard deviation and adding the mean. Right? That's an identity. I can always do that. And so because I have a Gaussian population distribution, I actually have two ways of implementing these models. I can do it by sampling theta, uh, the theta n and, and uh, phi, or I can do it by sampling the theta tilde n and phi. The advantage of the theta tilde n is that it's completely uncorrelated with phi, right? So instead of having that nasty funnel distribution, I have this nice, completely independent distribution. Right? This is infinitely easier to sample from. There's no pinches. There's no pathological reasons. Um, and so if we, when we talk about what, what's happening generally, the kind of intuitive implementation of these hierarchical models where we have a mean and a standard deviation, this is what we call a centered parameterization, right? It's because these, these random effects that we're sampling Right? These, these betas, in this case, are centered around the population mean. But these, this, this hierarchical prior, when it's centered, has this very, very nasty funnel shape. Uh, and so the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, has this very, very nasty funnel shape. Right? And so if we're trying to sample from the prior, this is really, really bad. In general, we have a little bit more complication because there's also data. Right? And so we not only have, for example, to think about sampling uh, the, the intercepts from the hierarchical prior, we also have to worry about the constraint of the likelihood. And so some interesting thing happens depending on how much data we have. If we don't have a lot of data, then we're completely dominated by the hierarchical prior. And in that case, our posterior looks like the funnel, and we have problem sampling. Right? But if we have lots of data, then the likelihood is actually going to cut out a very small region of this model. And then we can zoom that in so the posterior is actually going to look nice and independent. So the center parameterization has problems when there's not a lot of data. But if there's enough data, then things actually look really good. Interestingly enough, the non-centered parameterization has the opposite effect. Right? So in a non-centered parameterization, we're going to sample from these tildes. They're going to be normal 0, 1. And then we just reconstruct the betas. So in the multivariate case, we take a Cholesky decomposition, multiply the tildes by that, and then add the mean. Right? In the IID case, it's just multiplying the tildes by sigma and then adding mu. So this is the alternative non-centered implementation. Um, it's in code. Again, I apologize for the size, but it's hard to fit anything we're on here. Um, so let's just look at, see if we can focus in. Um, it's the same data block that I had before, almost the same parameters block. The only difference here is that I've called things tilde to differentiate them. And then in the model, two things are different. Firstly, the alpha tildes are distributed normal 0, 1, instead of being distributed mu sigma, right? because they're non-centered now. And then up here, when I was aggregating all of those, those alphas together, instead of just taking alpha tilde, I take alpha tilde, I multiply it by the appropriate standard deviation, and then I add the mean. Right? So I'm adding three means, and I'm adding three uh, sigma multiplied uh, alpha tildes. So very, very similar to implement. Not that much harder. The advantage of this model, however, is that it has a different conditional structure. Right? So now the alpha tilde and the mu and sigma alpha are independent, provided there's no data. But when there is data, now we get some correlation. We get some interaction through this path here. So what ends up happening is that we get the opposite behavior. Right? When we have uh, no data, or very, very sparse data, then we get this nice, clean, uh, almost independent posterior distribution. It's great. But when we have lots of data, something interesting happens. Because the likelihood constraint ends up looking like a funnel. And so the posterior ends up looking like a funnel. 
And so we have this dual behavior, right? When you have lots of data, the centered parameterization is better. But when you have sparse data, the non-centered parameterization is better, right? So we can see this all on a big table. OK, so the centered parameterization, the hierarchical geometry, right? This prior looks like a funnel. That's bad. The measurement geometry, the likelihood, that looks like a nice isotropic circle. And so when you have very sparse data, it's the hierarchical geometry that dominates, and we end up getting a bad posterior. But when we have lots of data, it's the measurement geometry that dominates, and we end up getting a nice, clean posterior. And then the opposite thing happens for the non-centered parameterization. We get a really nice hierarchical geometry. We get a really nasty measurement geometry so that when there's sparse data, things are good, and when there's dense data, things are bad. Right? But this is nice, because it means that when there's dense data, we know we want to use the centered parameterization. And when there's sp uh, sparse data, we want to use the non-centered parameterization. Right? And this can have really big consequences on performance. So not only do we have to worry about divergences and biases, even if you try to correct for all of that, you can see that we get orders of magnitude different performance depending on where we are on this curve. All right? So in the non, if you, what, uh, this sigma here is a kind of a measure of density of data. And as I vary that density, you can see that uh, uh, as the density, sorry, as, so as sigma gets larger, the data density decreases because we have kind of less constraining data. And so the non-centered parameterization has much, much faster performance. It's able to get effective sample size much more quickly, whereas the center parameterization has the opposite performance. And this is a gap here of about five orders of magnitude. Right? So a big, big change in performance. Um, and you can also see that this transition here, this, this crossover, is really, really narrow. So it turns out that most models are either completely dominated by the centered parameterization or completely dominated by the non-centered parameterization. Very rarely do you have to worry about a model that's somewhere in between. Right? So the idea is that when you're build, implementing these models, choose one that you think is going to be good. Non-centered is pretty good because we're building a hierarchical model usually because we don't have enough data. Right? If we had enough data, we wouldn't need a hierarchical model. So a priori, start with the non-centered parameterization. If you get divergences or if you have bad performance, then you can try the centered parameterization. Right? These are the two that you really want to keep in mind. Um, that said, there's still some subtleties. Uh, and we have to be careful about when we go to a multi-level model. So let's take uh, the same idea and go to a multi-level model, right? So in the uh, centered parameterization, I'm going to add a bunch of these slopes together. And each of those slopes is a hierarchical distribution to it. In the non-centered uh, parameterization, oops, there we go. Uh, non-centered parameterization, I'm going to do the same thing, but now I have these corrected intercepts, right? So notice something interesting here. There's going to be a lot of variation between the alpha tildes and the sigmas, right? But these means are all going to get aggregated together. In particular, it doesn't matter how well we can constrain the alpha ends. We can never really tell the difference between any of these means. In other words, they're what we call non-identified. Right? I can always take one of these means, make it bigger, make another one smaller, and I'll get exactly the same data. The data cannot tell me what value these should have by themselves. So what we really want to do is split that out and just have a single mean for all of these levels. Right? So the ideal thing to do is have some alpha naught that has a mean to it and some, uh, alpha, the rest of the alphas that do not have a mean. Right? They have some variation, but no mean. And so it's a little bit tricky in the centered parameterization, but it's really easy in the non-centered parameterization. Right? We just make most, we keep the same normal zero one priors, except we just have one of these alphas. Right? Um, so in terms of the model, which again, uh, has gotten a little big, um, uh, this is the uh, non-centered parameterization. And the only difference is that instead of having mu alpha 1 plus mu alpha 2 plus mu alpha 3, I just have the one mu alpha here. Right? And then in the parameters block, instead of having mu alpha 1, mu alpha 2, mu alpha 3, I just have the one single mu alpha. Um, OK. So uh, I, will, I will end uh, there. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, we can perhaps go in, and, and, and I'll, I can highlight those, those models a little bit more. Uh, but that's the general story. right? And you can kind of see how quickly these things get complicated. Not only do you have to worry about
the flexibility in building the model. You have to worry about the computational aspects. Now, Stan makes that pretty good, right? Stan's able to fit a lot of these models really well, and when it doesn't, it will inform you. Um, but what it can't do is tell you when you're having problems how to make the model better, right? Stan can't tell you that there's a non-centered parameterization out there. So really taking advantage of Stan requires you to not just know intuitively what it's HMC is trying to do, but really understand the, the potential diversity of model implementations, right? Centered versus non-centered. Um, potentially different link functions, um, all kinds of different tricks, uh, stronger priors, weaker priors, right? These modeling choices will have very, very strong consequences on the models that you build. So as much as we might try to decouple modeling from computation, there's always going to be some interaction there, especially as you're building models that are really on the frontiers of applied statistics. You know, the harder work you do, the more you're going to have to be experts at both. Um, so, uh, I mean, I know a lot of you guys are doing some really cool models, uh, and for those who are a little bit uh, less experienced with it, I'd recommend starting simple. You know, start with simple models. Start with linear regression. Then move up to general linear regression. Then start playing with hierarchies. Kind of add uh, new components to your arsenal of, of modeling techniques. Um, and only when you feel comfortable, uh, move on to the next one. Um, and you know, then expand your repertoire and, and able to build uh, even, even bigger models. Um, I will note that a lot of this stuff is discussed in the stand manual. Um, so it's a great resource if those are interested. Um, you guys had talked about doing a Japanese translation at some point. Um, I, I, I'm not sure of the status of that or, or, or where that will be posted, but uh, if, it, if we ever hear about it, we'll talk about it on the send users list. i am certainly announced that. Um, and there's various papers in uh, the stand manual that discuss uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these issues. Um, so, so there's definitely plenty of literature uh, to, to look at and lots of discussion on the users list where we've talked about these issues and the kind of models that you have to, model tweaks that you have to do. Um, so I encourage you to check all that out, um, but certainly, hopefully, none of this will, will prevent you. None of these complications will prevent you from continuing to using Stan and continue building these complicated models because the reward when you get it right is tremendous. The, it's amazing the inferences you can make when you have these structures. Um, all right, so I will, I will leave it at that, and I'm happy. I guess we're, we're a bit early. Um, I, I have plenty of slides <laughs> on other things to talk about if people are interested in. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm happy to talk about modeling and, and, and other questions you might have. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah, OK. Uh, I have a question. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, I want to ask um, how to measure the sparseness of data uh, to yeah. select a uh, centered or no centered model. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, there is no way to do that because it depends on the exact shape of your likelihood and how it relates to the population distribution. Um, so in some sense, the best way to measure the sparsity is to look to see if you get divergences in the centered versus non-centered parameterization, right? So uh, we haven't found a good diagnostic that's able to tell a priori which model you might want to use. We just know that models tend to be sparse in data because we tend to be in this wide data regime. Um, and we know that if we check and look for these divergences, it's a good indication we want to try the other one. Um, so, unfortunately, I mean, we've done a lot of work into this to try to find some diagnostic that tells us it's just too complicated. There's just too many ways it could go. Um, so I'd recommend uh, starting with non-centered and just, you know, watching the, the diagnostics. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that you can center or non-center every group differently, right? So one covariate might be centered and one might be non-centered because each of them could have different data, right? So imagine um, you have a population of n individuals. If one of the groups splits it up into n minus 2 and 2, that's going to be kind of sparse data. But n over 2 and minus versus n over 2 might be dense data, right? So it's, there's some tricky combinatorical possibilities there. Yeah, I see. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish we knew better, but as we, we have not been able to find any kind of generic patterns that, that could tell you that. Thank you. Yeah. And if anybody knows of any, let us know. <laughs> I was going to try to zoom this, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, I have more, one more question. Yeah, please. And um, some traditional statistician said, said um, the prior of beta, 
uh, normal of zero ten uh -huh. is uh, a little subjective, so because uh, if you change if you change the zero twenty or zero five, mm -hmm. the uh, result uh, will be uh, will, yeah. will change. Mm -hmm. So uh, how to explain? Uh, how yeah sh should I explain uh, in such a situation? Yeah, I mean, well, okay. So there's multiple ways that you could um, try try winning that argument. Um, on one hand, you could argue that the likelihood is just as subjective, right? Why did we choose, um, you know, a Gaussian population distribution? Why did we choose a Gaussian likelihood or a binomial likelihood or Bernoulli? Well, we did it because it was simple, and we hope it matched. But they're all assumptions, right? All inference is is, is making assumptions, and then learning things conditioned on those assumptions. So we're always very careful when people talk about, well, the priors are arbitrary. Well, so is the likelihood, right? All of this stuff is arbitrary at some level. The best you can do is report what you did and let everyone else judge fairly the assumptions that you made. Um, at the same time, and, and, and another way of thinking about that is if you're a classical statistician, you're probably adding regularization into your model, right? You're not just fitting the model. You're going to add some kind of quadratic regularization, a ridge or, a, um, or an L1 net or something like that, right? And that's also going to change your answer in a very similar fashion, right? Because it's adding more assumptions into the model. Um, so you're never going to be able to get around that. Uh, and so what we always recommend is, you know, check, sim check sim uh, simulations, right? So, so simulate data from your model, make sure you can recover it to make sure that, you know, at least you're self-consistent within the assumptions. And then you do things like posterior predictive checks to make sure that you're not overfitting or underfitting uh, the data. Um, and that gets you as robust as any frequentist analysis uh, can. Um, but ultimately, you should have to acknowledge that all of these things are subjective choices. Um, and there's, there's no wiggling around that. Thank you very much. Any other questions? That's better. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question about uh -huh. uh, parallelization. Yeah. Uh, does Stan use CUDA or something to parallelize the HMC process? No. Um, so parallelization is tricky, right, because Markov means you can't parallelize, right? So the, the Markov and Markov chain of Monte Carlo means you can't run the next transition until you've done the transition before that. So it drastically limits the kind of, of naive parallelization you can get in other algorithms. The only real place that we... There's two places you can parallelize in Stan. The first is that you can parallelize over different chains, right? You can run many, many chains, and we recommend that you do because you can do things like R hat to catch some of these, these uh, uh, potential pathologies. Um, and in fact, if you run RSTAN, it will, uh, depending on a, a switch you can do when you run it, it will automatically determine the number of cores you have and run over those cores. Um, so, so the chains is easy. That's something that, that you can do pretty platform independently. Uh, the other way you could parallelize is try to parallelize the actual likelihood calculations, right? Uh, and that would require parallelizing our autodiff library. And we're not against that, but one of the challenges we have is that we have to support Windows, Mac, and, and Linux. And Windows is really bad at supporting a lot of the C++ technology that we would use to parallelize. Um, in other words, things like CUDA depend on your hardware. Right? So if you have one GPU versus another, we can't write two sets of code. And we also you know, can't optimize it enough. Right? These things are so tricky to do. Um, so we would like to have something like that in the future, but we just don't have the manpower to be able to uh, have the hardware optimizations to really take advantage of it. Because if we don't do it right, you end up getting worse behavior, right? You end up just spending too much time on I.O. and, and things, things start uh, getting slower. Um, so for particular applications, if you had some crazy big application, you could take some of our C++ code and parallelize it yourself. That's a, a possibility. Um, but in general, we just not at the point where there's enough hardware unification. Um, and model kind of uh, simplicity that we could do something like that at the moment. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the discussion. Um, I'm really happy to know new things today, especially this pathological likelihood mm -hmm. or distributions. And I think one of the questions was how to judge if the distribution is good or not. Mm -hmm. And in, in your presentation, what I saw is the if the distribution is kind of convex, is it okay? If the not, if like a sticky, it's mm -hmm. not really good. Is this some kind of a 
uh, you know, uh, rule of thumb or something. Mm-hmm. So, so that, okay, so that kind of, st- uh, it wasn't quite a non-convexity, right? Because the whole circle was non-convex, right? Because you could cut it. Um, so the pinch, it's kind of adding like a higher order non-convexity to it. Um, and all that does is make it harder to fit. There's nothing wrong with the model. It's just hard to fit the model, right? When you go to a non-centered parameterization, you're still getting the same, tip, like you're mapping forward to the same typical set. You're just fitting it in a different way that makes it easier to do that. Um, so there's two questions, right? The first question is, how can you tell when you have a model that's hard to fit because of some pathology like that? And there's, there's not many things to do. This is one of the reasons why MCMC traditionally has been so hard, because we don't have the diagnostics to tell when something's wrong. So the state of the art is really something like HMC that has these divergences that tell you something is wrong. Um, and then doing things like the Gelman-Rubin statistic, so this R hat, where you run multiple chains and make sure that they're all consistent. Because what happens is if you have a bad region like that and the chains are getting stuck, they're not going to get stuck at the same rate. And so one chain will get stuck, the others will look fine, and then when you try to compare them, you'll see that they're different, and that will be a nice indication. So the most robust thing that you can do for that is to run as many chains as possible, compare them with the R-hat statistic, and then look at things like divergences. And there's a few other diagnostics that we've introduced recently that might also help. Um, And that's the best you can hope for at the moment, right? We're always looking for more, but that's kind of the state of the art. The, the second part of it is, is, and I don't think this is quite what your question was, but there's also the question of how can you tell if your distribution is, say, consistent with the data, right? How is it, that's just a question of is your model good? Um, and this is what you address with things like posterior predictive checks. Thank you. Uh, I have actually one more question sure. to ask if I have time. So uh, here we, we specify what kind of prior information you feed into. Mm-hmm. But in some cases, we have online learning system mm-hmm. where we want to input current knowledge mm-hmm. as the prior mm-hmm. and update day by day or month by month. Right. Is it possible in stand? So it depends. Um, the, the challenge here is that when you're doing something online, and you want to take your old posterior and use it as your new prior, uh, very rarely is that going to be simpler analytic unless you have, say, conjugate priors, right? You have to have very, very limited models. And so there's very, it's unlikely you're going to have something exact that you can do. Um, so that leaves you with the option of, of taking something like posterior samples and then taking a mean and a, and a variance and then using that to simplify and approximate some kind of new prior. Yeah, right. Unfortunately, that has... Uh, it doesn't work super well. And, and the big problem is that a Gaussian is not a great approximation to any kind of non-Gaussian distribution, right? And so if you're doing stand because you have a big complicated model that has a non-Gaussian posterior, then it's unlikely that that's going to be a good strategy. Um, really, the best thing to do is, is what's called sequential, sequential Monte Carlo, um, which tr- kind of is Monte Carlo but allows for this idea that you have data coming in at different rates or any, some kind of time variation like that. Um, it has a kind of a, a different computational challenge, but it, you, you could use something like Campbell 20 and Monte Carlo with it. Um, so it, it, it stands not really focused, it kind of uh, compatible with that idea because we're focused on one set of data, one inference at a time, and then you'd have to hack it to somehow you stand within that. Um, I'd, if you do have online stuff and the online stuff is important and you can't just say throw, like, there's still, okay, so if, like, if you actually have data coming in every day or every week, you could throw away the previous week's data and just start from new, right? You could say, look, things are varying a lot in time. Let's not do that. Or you just include all the data together, right? And, and, and provided that you've got this, the, uh, the hardware to do that, you can scale up. Or you can make it hierarchical, right, and have like week by week by week. Um, uh, one thing to look at is this uh, birthday example that Andy Gelman did with Aki Ventari, uh, where they had data of every day number of births. And what they did is they considered uh, random effects for the day of the week, the week of the year, the year of the, of the century, right? So it's still kind of doing a time series, but what you're doing is pulling out representative data and allows you to kind of sparsify it a little bit and, and get rid of things. So there's all kinds of tricks that you can do, but the generic answer is you have to go beyond MCMC if you want to be able to fit that kind of model with, with any kind of, of generality. Um, and that's what Sequential Monte Carlo does. Uh, we haven't done it in STAN because we're kind of focused on different problems, but there's a lot of software out there that, that attempts to do it. Um, and there's even been some talk about combining uh, those softwares and having them call the STAN libraries to get some kind of, of use of that. Thank you.
anything else? Any other questions? We still have 45 minutes for pizza. <laughs> so we're all going to sit here awkwardly in the dark or, or have a conversation. Um, we have covered everything on the agenda. It looks like we've finished ahead of schedule, um, so let's wrap up early again. I'd like to thank you for taking out taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks again, guys.